session of October programming for this year's virtual Peace and Justice Studies Association annual meeting. My name is Michelle Collin Sibley. I'm on the board of PGSA and also a part of the committee that brought you this virtual conference this year. And I'm very pleased to welcome you all to Storytelling, Scholarship and Activism. Uh, we have three uh, fabulous papers, interesting um, participants. Uh, first, uh, Christopher Davey, who is, uh, holds a doctorate in Peace Studies and International Development with the University of Bradford. His research focuses on identity, narrative, and emerging perspectives on genocide, and includes field work with the Banya Malinga, Banya Malenge soldiers in Central Africa and within the diaspora. He's interested in evaluating the development of narrative analysis as a qualitative study of participation and genocide and the intersections of mass violence, identity, and climate change. He's currently teaching political science at Brigham Young University. Next, Gabriel Erzgard a confidence tale and plotting nonviolent fiction. Gabriel is the interviews editor for the Peace Chronicle. He earned his Doctor of Letters from Jew Drew University with a dissertation on environmental themes in a medieval legend. This received the university's Dean Payne Prize for best interdisciplinary dissertation. Gabriel has recently left his full-time English lecturer position to have more time to research and write and will very soon be moving from New Jersey back to Oregon. Gabriel is not only a humanities scholar, but also a creative writer. His criticism, poetry, and fairy tales have appeared in various print and digital publications. And finally, Storytelling for Social Change at Cincinnati's Harriet Beecher Stowe House with John Getz. John Gatz retired in 2017 after teaching American literature for 45 years at Xavier University in Cincinnati. He has a long-standing interest in the intersections of literature and peace studies and has published articles on Ursula Le Guin's The Left Hand of Darkness and Leslie Marmon Silko's Ceremony from that perspective. Since retiring, he has volunteered as a docent, discussion leader, and 19th century literary consultant for Cincinnati's Harriet Beecher Stowe House. He is co-author of Visiting Uncle Tom's Cabin, university-style discussions in a historic house museum and the current issue of the Journal of Mid Museum Education. He also appears in the documentary Beca Becoming Harriet Beecher Stowe, released this year by Fourth Wall Films. And his, his paper is entitled Storytelling for Social Change at Cincinnati's Harriet Beecher Stowe House. So I'll turn it over to Chris. Okay, thanks, Michelle. I'm I'm gonna share a, a couple of or a few slides with you. Um, let me just make sure I can get this going here. Okay. I'm assuming you can all see that, and it's just coming up now. Let's go back to the beginning, shall we? Sorry. Uh, there we go. Okay. I believe you can all see that now. Uh, let me know if you can't. I'm just assuming you can. Um, so what I wanted to share with you today is a, a bit more of a reflexive paper uh, that I've been working on. Um, just regarding some uh, you know, field work that I've done in the last few years and kind of the necessary transition that I've made uh, to doing field work more remotely, uh, working more with diasporas, um, connecting with them via uh, social media and Zoom and, and other ways um, to just try and uh, sort of keep my, uh, keep contact with you know, the people that I research with uh, and sort of keep building an understanding of, of their perspectives. So what I've, want to share with you is is the sort of the I guess the, the moral and um, practical issues that I've come across um, and just some of the things that I think are important to bear in mind particularly from the context of genocide studies um, so this is kind of my home in in a lot of ways um, I sort of have a, a foot in the 
um, in the, the peace studies camp from uh, you know my experience at Bradford and some involvement with PGSA, but um, very much so in genocide studies as well. So I'm going to be talking about it from the genocide studies perspective, um, and that's kind of be going to be where I'm speaking to you from. Uh, the two images I've got on here uh, highlight the two of the case studies that I'm going to just share with you, and I'll kind of go back and forth on these two case studies. The one on um, on the left. Uh, with a few people with the big uh, blue banner with the yellow tree is uh, a group of young uh, Banya Malenge, uh, ref settled refugees, members of the diaspora, uh, protesting in Canada uh, around the anniversary of the Gatumba massacre. Uh, and I'll talk more about that uh, in a little bit. Um, but it, suffice to say that this one event, uh, you know, 166 people were, uh, were killed. Um, in this refugee camp uh, just on the border of Burundi and Congo. Uh, and it's been a, it is a sort of a key narrative moment and also uh, a key moment for um, calling for justice within the community as well. So um, I'm gonna, I'll come back to that in a bit, but that I just wanna sort of highlight that to you. And then in a similar way on the other side here, we've got uh, the Anglophone Cameroon diaspora or community um, or the, British uh, Southern Cameroonians, as they identify themselves, uh, protesting here as well as a group of settled refugees diaspora in the global north. Um, and I'll talk about sort of each of the causes and how that's interacted with my research and uh, analysis of genocide. Uh, but there's just sort of a bit of a preview here. And one of the things that I've been confronted with as I've looked at these two cases and uh, one you know, more uh, with the Banya Malenge than with Cameroon. Um, one of the things I've looked at is how the how a narrative of genocide is used and to what end and for what purpose, um, and then how it's how do I figure out my job in trying to interpret that and to use it and to what extent do I analyze and critique and, and so on. So that's kind of the the direction I'm going and kind of the flavor for what we're looking at briefly here today. Um, so. Uh, there's a little quote here, uh, and this kind of dropped out of the blue, so to speak. Um, I'd been arranging to interview a, uh, a legal activist for one of these two communities. Uh, this is someone who is in the diaspora, uh, outside of their home country, but uh, still in uh, the continent of Africa. Uh, I was trying to negotiate sort of some time to speak with him uh, about uh, his work, his perspective, uh, and just to kind of get some more insight on the uh, diaspora narrative. And so I sent, uh, I sent you know, a polite invitation as you would. <laughs> um, and he asked for a list of questions and I sent a list of questions, which was kind of a mix of uh, sort of critical questions, but then sort of more general questions as well. Um, and this is the response that I got back. And we've had, you know, some polite exchange since this email, um, just sort of agreed to, um, you know, not to speak to each other. Uh, but this is what he said to me, he said, you know, I've read your questions and I do not see uh, any which seems to point towards a desire to help and end the war and conflict, to understand the conflict from the angle of the fundamental aspects of international law governing the conflict. We are in war and our people are being killed on a daily basis. Um, and it kind of, it stopped me in my tracks and I thought, well, okay, fair enough. But then am I doing the right things for you or for your, your community and trying to represent the story? But then am I doing too much of the right things for, for me trying to uh, conform to uh, disciplinary, um, uh, disciplinary measures like good scholarship and, and so forth. So uh, this quote, you know, kind of dropped out of the blue this week as I was you know, finishing off my preparations for today. And I thought that was a good place to start because it really captures for me some of the complexities that I faced as I've addressed the question of genocide with these two groups um, and trying to do it in a way that is intersubjective, but it still is problematic. And so this is sort of the, you know, just a couple of points that I'm going to try and address with you today is this very problematic nature, necessarily problematic, right? It has to be addressed. We can't just ignore it. This question of how genocide fits into diaspora narratives and academic research. Uh, and I've mentioned to you the two, two cases we're gonna be looking at, Banyam Lenge and, and Cameroon. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about those, just to give you a, just a bit of background so it makes sense. 
Um, and I'm just going to share with you some thoughts um, on uh, reflexivity and scholar activism within the study of genocide, but then a little bit more broadly on, on both of those as well. And I'd like to try <laughs> and offer some conclusions uh, about decolonization and knowledge production. Um, I've tried to define scholar activism here. I'm not settled with that. There are lots of definitions of this out there, but I wanted to just, um, you know, as a genocide scholar, we like defining things. So I, I tried to put a put a label on uh, what scholar activism is. So I you know, would really appreciate some conversation and, and thoughts from you all about uh, some of the recommendations I make at the end, and then also about how we define some of these phenomena as well. So, uh, Going back to the context of genocide studies, uh, genocide studies is a, um, a very interesting field. It's a very small field, but you could argue it's quite far reaching. Um, for me personally, and there are lots of ways to define genocide, uh, and it's important to make sure that you know, a definition is, uh, is used because it, it is a contested concept and that's important, but it's also equally essential to sort of tie yourself to uh, a way of thinking about this concept and so generally for myself and my research um to help you know frame what we're talking about today i see genocide as a, a destruction of a social group right and this is a relational phenomena um it's all about the you know the, not only power relations but the relations between individuals on the ground between collective groups between the international community and those groups on the ground um so it's an intensely relational um phenomenon a lot of what we can attribute to the word genocide and to its study today can be should be traced back to um, Raphael Lemkin. So if you're not familiar with Raphael Lemkin, I'm, I'm sure you've probably heard of the chat, a Polish a jurist who more or less single handedly you know, brought about this concept, framed it, published on it, uh, and then also um, was a significant actor in bringing about the United Nations Convention for the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. Uh, and so in a very intense way, Lemkin was not only a survivor of genocide, himself um, Polish escaping um, in Nazi uh, Europe uh, in 1939, uh, was very much a scholar, an activist, a jurist, a linguist, sociologist, historian, negotiator. He was all of these things and more. Um, after the, uh, the passing of the Genocide Convention at the UN, he was involved in helping uh, uh, Algerian groups construct a case against uh, French authorities uh, under the question of you know, war crimes and genocide. Uh, it was also involved in helping uh, sort of domestic legislatures passing laws that supported the UN Convention. So even after sort of his big moment, he continued to persist and push for something that he was very passionate about. And indeed, someone motivated not only by his own sort of uh, group's experience identifying as a Polish Jew, but then also identifying with Armenians during uh, World War One and the genocide that they faced. Um, so this is someone that persisted uh, in his work and, and lays lay sort of like a, a heavy burden for genocide scholars today to be engaged in similar, way, similar ways. Um, I'll be brief with the rest of this here. So my own research engages in narrative analysis. Um, so I, I work with uh, you know, have worked with you know, present former soldiers and your know, diaspora groups to understand uh, narratives through implotments. So using um, a very, um, uh, sorry, I'm blanking. Oh, Paul Ricoeur, <laughs> sorry, using a Paul Ricoeur's approach to you know, engage in narrative implotment that individuals uh, and collectively as groups engage or produce. Um, and this is, in, in my view, in the view of many others, is sort of a really important and necessary part of expansion of political science, or sort of maybe even a revisiting of this trend or this, this sort of theme and methodology. Um, we need more of this sort of qualitative work within a political science, not only because it, um, it challenges sort of that drive for positivism, and that I'll touch on a little bit here today, but it also is a way of kind of making information um, more accessible to communities if it's retold, if the story is retold in a way that makes sense to them, whereas a lot of political science ne perhaps necessarily doesn't do that. Um, so I engage in an intersubjective method, um, you know, Caroline Reisman's similar sort of method uh, to be able to sort of attend with uh, participants to have them tell me the story and then I go through, analyze, and then produce something that is readable for everybody. Hard to do, but it's, it's a kind of 
my you know my sort of what guides my attempts um in my in my scholarship um and so one of the key features of this is this idea of reflexivity and so thinking about those power relationships thinking about that critical examination of my own work and knowledge knowledge production and and who does that knowledge belong to and where am i situated as a researcher and this is really important for folks within genocide studies and for all of us as think about you know well what is it that we're creating and for what purpose um, and there's so many things that to balance that out with you know career demands um, demands for recognition of voice amongst diaspora communities and, and many other features as well. Um, so I'll just say a little bit here about the field work that I've engaged in. Uh, I'll just try and be brief here and just to sort of talk about how I've tried to transition, not being able to travel as much uh, in the last year um, for various reasons, not the least of them being the global pandemic. Um, so much of my field work in Rwanda and DR Congo Took place, took place you know, with Banya Malenge soldiers. Uh, Banya Malenge are Congolese Tutsi that live in Eastern Congo. They're a community that have been settled there for centuries and have been the subject of anti-Tutsi violence for, depending on who you talk to, for a long time, at least certainly since the 1990s and the, um, the, the, the massive fallout from the Rwandan genocide in 1994. And so I examined you know, with, these, uh, with these soldiers how they identified themselves, trying to look beyond sort of these uh, genocide studies uh, characterizations or categories of victims and perpetrators, because these soldiers invariably engaged in uh, community self-defense, they engaged in attacking um, refugees, they engaged in you know, broad conflict and uh, civil war and violence uh, throughout the decades. And so I you know, worked with them to try and untangle the narrative from these simplified terms to see these multiple experiences of genocide that they uh, ascribed to and identified. Um, so as I've you know sort of been a bit more stuck at home, so to speak, I've tried to transition to thinking a little bit more about how I can engage with these communities um, digitally or virtually. And so I've been able to uh, connect with groups uh, in the UK where I've lived recently and, and now in the US where, where we currently live um, and sort of thinking about how I can continue looking at this community story, thinking about that Gatumba massacre that I mentioned at the beginning um, and how you know my scholarship can highlight the story but still offer a sort of a critical voice of it. Um, I've also sort of branched out to thinking about you know what's going on in Cameroon at the moment and have engaged with a few academics and activists that are involved in the separatist or independence movement, depending on who you talk to or what media you consume. Uh, and then also looking at how uh, groups within this independence movement use social media and depict genocide and depict the suffering that their people are engaging in. And then likewise, silence some of the violence that um, Anglophone uh, militias engage in as well. So that's just a little bit of an overview of where I've been and, and you know who I've been talking to and sort of whose stories I've been engaging with. Um, I'm, I'm going to just sort of do my best to keep to time here and try not to go uh, through this very dense slide too quickly. Um, so I've just in recently, um, you know, in sort of in light of the conference, but then also thinking critically about my own work for a few years. Um, you know, how, what does scholar activism mean and how do we engage with this? Um, in in the complex ways that it needs to be engaged with. Um, the idea of sort of whose knowledge is a key one. Um, and it in, very intriguingly, uh, you know, stems back to um, kind of the title of Sandra Harding's uh, book, Whose Science, Whose Knowledge. Um, and this, the notion of, uh, you know, beginning with feminism, but broadening out in sort of standpoint um, epistemology. Um, one of my Cameroonian uh, participants, in conversations I've had with them, uh, said stressed me the importance and validity and um, credibility of standpoint um, epistemologies and sort of looking at the looking at the oppressed from their point of view. Um, and this is really intriguing. We had some conversations about that and what that meant and what that meant for the story uh, and how that's interpreted. So I maybe try and come back to that, or we can uh, have some questions on it on the end. In the end, but there's a few sort of recent. Um, conversations about 
skull activism that I found really helpful um, in my sort of you know review of, of what I've been doing and just sort of again sort of critiquing my own work. Um, uh, Suzuki um, Mayorga is you know a, you know presented some really good views in the Routledge and Derrickson um, also and I, I won't sort of read through what we've got here but they sort of emphasize that tie um, that knowledge production creates that often is neglected in genocide studies, political science, and perhaps a lot of other fields as well, is that we go, we extract, we leave, and then produce information knowledge for a different audience. Um, and so being tied and being accountable to that community as an audience and as a sort of a, as a community is, is fundamental. Um, and there's also this thing about at spaces as well, which I really liked, um, you know, what Ralph and Derrickson talk about here. Uh, you know, this sort of thing about critical and distance that I know that I've used and engaged in, um, but it has limitations, right? And I think that many participants get a sense uh, for that, right? Uh, many of the people I spoke to, soldiers or political activists, wanted to know what it was that I would be giving to their cause and their community as a result of my research, um, which, you know, you know, again, <laughs> resulted in lengthy conversations about what my role and purpose was, um, but have, have challenged me in the right ways and sort of pushed me to you know, doing what I can to con sort of constructively engage um, in these shared spaces. Uh, of course, you know, I'm, you know, Letter Arc, uh, you know, is a, a powerful voice in, in our community. Uh, this idea of restoring, I think, is important. And perhaps others will mention this today. But this idea of sort of embracing and not avoiding the complexities and paradoxes of different narratives, conflicting narratives, memory and the past and, and so on. And so I, you know, sought ways to try and engage in this in this problem. Um, I'm sort of in the middle, and I haven't got enough results back to really share something substantial with you, but I'm in the middle of actually surveying uh, genocide scholars on their scholar activism. Um, some of the preliminary findings that I've sort of found um, was thinking about, you know, well, what, how are ethical considerations framed by um, you know, the restrictions that governments may place on our research. So Rwanda, um, Cambodia, two great examples of this, where the government has a really a firm control over memory and narratives of the past, uh, producing official narratives, uh, and that creates constraints for researchers. Uh, and so if you're doing research on the genocide in Rwanda, it has to fit within that narrative. Um, you know, critical, overly critical, or even flatly critical research largely isn't accepted. Um, so a lot of my research can't take place in Rwanda because of its sort of critical nature to that uh, to that extent. Um, and also, I you know quizzed or I asked in this survey uh, genocide scholars about how they approach their activism. And and most at this point, most felt like it was uh, their role was to add professional expertise and critical assessment, um, and and less so to sort of wholly adopt uh, the deployments of genocide that many groups will use. So where is genocide studies on this sort of massive set of, of issues uh, and challenges? Uh, in many ways, and in the past, the field has sort of been split by, uh, you know, connections to different associations and networks, one, some being more um, attached to uh, activist engagement and making declarations, statements on ongoing genocides and others more committed to scholarly work. Uh, also, you know, sort of falling down this line um, you have debates about Israel and Palestine within this community of genocide scholars, which become extremely um, volatile, <laughs> problematic, um, which sort of demonstrates some of that split between approaches to activism and scholarship and the, you know, sort of, you know, the middle ground between them. Darfur is a really important um, case here for thinking about how we deploy genocide and how genocide studies as a, as a group responded to this event. Um, and there's some great work by Alex DeWall and also a piece by Mahmoud Mamdani, an African scholar, um, which I'll highlight at the end here. And really sort of addressing, you know, well, actually, the word genocide can be unhelpful when we apply it um, in a blanket sense. And are there other concepts, other vehicles for legal redress, for negotiation, for drawing attention to um, atrocities? Uh, there's also a problem of militariz militarization in the field. 
so you know uh, scholars working with uh, the US military CIA or refusing to and, and so on and so this is you know an issue in other parts of political science but um, becoming has become a, a challenge in, in genocide studies as well and there's always this this issue of trying to deal with the politics of memory and trauma many scholars will go for a favored trauma you layer that on top then with uh, uh, you know scholars who identify as survivors or as part of a victim group uh, and makes it particularly uh, again I use that word challenging to have a critical scholarly discussion about memory and trauma but ultimately, you know, the, the drive for the field at the moment is towards sort of opening up that canon um, beyond sort of very uh, sort of tightly protected case studies in Holocaust and Rwanda and so on. And thinking more broadly about colonialism, thinking more broadly about uh, cultural destruction or ongoing violence as well. Um, so I'll just highlight a couple of things here, and I think I, I'm going to really try and be good for my time here. So if to forgive me <laughs> uh, if I go too fast or... Um, I'll run over a little bit here. We'll see how we go. Um, I just want to mention a couple of things about our two case studies again, real quick. Um, these are ongoing conflicts. Um, just recently, uh, well, in the last two years, but then just recently, there have been increased attention to uh, violence against Banya Malenge from uh, other groups, and that's tied up with um, racism. It's tied up with a uh, political ineptitude in the center in Kinshasa, uh, the inability of the military and maybe even the UN peacekeepers to protect people. Um, but it's also deeply embedded in sort of these layered experiences of genocide. Um, and so whenever I engage with Banya Malenge uh, participants about uh, their experiences and their community, I receive a, a long durée in storytelling almost every time. Um, and I, you know, try to delicately sort of move around, you know, well, you know, I'm very familiar with this and like, okay, that's good. Let's go back to 1960 and let me tell you what happened, right? And so there's a, a real importance for a narrative within this community. Um, and a part of that today, particularly with the young, younger generation is sort of fighting for legal recognition and for justice for um, the attack on this Katumba refugee camp in 2004. So these are sort of contemporary issues. Uh, the image here is from a farmer that was killed uh, in the last month. Uh, his funeral sort of brought a lot of attention. Uh, international press sort of made their way and you know, documented the funeral. One of the ways in which this event or this series of events and this violence there has been promoted a bit more recently. Um, it, in Cameroon, uh, you know, sort of Anglophone regions here in the uh, southwest and um, northwest provinces uh, that neighbor with um, you know, what is the sort of Biafra area of uh, Nigeria. Um, it's, it's been under constant conflict in, in the same period in the last few years. Um, and one of the challenges just recently in the last couple of weeks here, uh, this classroom in Akumba is a bilingual classroom and um, many Anglophone uh, or British Southern Cameroon militias uh, have sort of tried to enforce a boycott of French or bilingual schools and have enforced it violently. And it's believed, it's yet to be sort of fully verified as believed that they went into this bilingual school and killed um, several children um, whilst they were in school catching up on extra classes on a Saturday a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago. So there is then this you know, challenge here, you know, when you speak to the activists and scholars in the British Southern Cameroonian diaspora, they'll say that, oh, well, this is the Cameroonian military, you know, um, you're pretending to be our militias. Um, and so there is then within the storytelling that comes out of this activist group, a lot of competing narratives and a sort of a lack of um, sort of direct connection to information on the ground in some respects and it rife in the online campaigning that this group does are sort of repeated genocide tropes um lots of imagery of um violated bodies um women men and children um you know repeated sort of incessantly as sort of proof of genocide with a lack of sort of analytical content or just sort of descriptive content so across these two cases I, the sort of the things that I've taken away is sort of the particular challenges for uh, storytelling in the field of genocide studies and thinking about this reflexively um, is trying to navigate diaspora information sources, right? So diaspora are the ones by and large in these two conflicts and many others that are sort of spreading knowledge about 
their crisis and their conflict and what some claim as a genocide. Um, but where they get the information from is increasingly from circulated stuff online and perhaps you with glimpses of stuff on the ground from family and relatives that may be connected by phone or smart devices. Um, there's also a bit of an abrogation of agency here. We see in both cases, self-defense groups and armed groups engaging in their own violence, um, but the agency of that is kind of washed away um, through the kind of the confusion on the ground uh, and the denial in some respects of that violence. There is definitely a simplification of identities going on in both of these cases that I've had to sort of grapple with um, and sort of uh, then it's very easy within genocide studies to latch onto that and to, uh, to go with it, right? Because it presents a very simple, a very translatable narrative, one which indeed, you know, um, news media uses as well. Um, and then there is, I've kind of indicated this a moment ago, a bit of a, a divergence or a gap between activism abroad and then what happens in the home country. Again, where they get information from, what it means, how they're then presenting that to the wider world as a case for intervention or for justice. Um, so I'm going to finish here. I, I think I've kind of kept well to time. And this is where, you know, I, you know, would be looking for, you know, your input on when we get to questions. Um, you know, I, I try to ensure that my work is decolonized through making sure that it's accessible in terms of language and translation, um, that it, it, it takes on board the complexity of colonization within um, within the scholarship, but that also uh, within my own writing that is. Um, but then I also recognize the power relations that I engage in personally and that I sort of bring to the table with my own privilege when I'm out in the field or when I'm on the phone or on Zoom or on WhatsApp with somebody um, and the added dynamic that that brings into it. So for me, you know, moving from that starting point of decolonization, I can then sort of find a point of criticality to use expertise and, and sort of knowledge, scholarly knowledge to, to help bring further understanding to sort of ongoing cases. Um, but doing so in a way that creates solidarities, and this is one thing that is quite, um, uh, has been quite well addressed recently in scholar activist work, is, you know, how we're building solidarities, right? We're not necessarily um, you know, giving in, or not giving in, we're not necessarily buying into um, whole, wholly victim narratives, um, you know, where we have sort of this very um, you know, easy version of what's going on. Um, what Mamdani, I've quoted him here, is a very simple moral world, right? So we can create the solidarities without buying into or supporting sort of that simplified version. And then that leading to knowledge production. Um, but it, it's a cycle, right? It's, you know, it's not something that's sort of done once and then you've, you've got it down, right? It's, it's a process of continual reflexivity uh, on, on the work. So I'll end here with just a quote from Tony Barter. Tony Barter is, is a good example of a genocide scholar activist working in Australia on the Holocaust, but then also looking at colonial violence and genocide against uh, indigenous uh, groups in our Aboriginal groups in Australia. I'll read this quote here and I'll finish. Um, he says, liberating genocide, it's the term and the concept that is, liberating genocide from historical distortions, from restriction to a reductive legal concept and from containment in an academic speciality. Our objective now, overcoming differences of starting point and vocabulary must be to engage more widely with all who care about the destruction of peoples and the cultural losses to humanity. So this is a very sort of Lemkinian approach, um, one that you know, motivates me and I think sort of helps us as a, as a field sort of point forward to where we need to go. Um, and I, the last thing I'd say is that, you know, there's a, there's a real gap in collaboration and, and, and work between you know, peace studies circles um, and genocide studies. Um, there are some that you know, work in this space, but um, it's, it's a bit of a vacant space at the moment. So uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. And I'll pass it back to you. <laughs> Do I need to, I probably need to stop sharing. Don't I? Thank you, Chris. Um, we'll hold our questions to the end. And I'll uh, turn to you, Gabriel. All right, sounds good. So gonna share my screen and then um, 
pull up there. There we go. All right. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. So, yes. Yeah, so, the title of my presentation is The Confidence Tale and Plotting Nonviolent Fiction. So, I'm a, I'm a fan of the movie Selma, the Ava DuVernay's Martin Luther King biopic. What you'll notice that makes this movie different than a lot of others is that a nonviolent campaign constitutes the main heroic action. Of course, this is based on a true story. But compare Salma to, say, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or the Star Wars saga, or the Fast and the Furious franchise, and you quickly realize that these the stories featuring nonviolent heroism are dwarfed by stories featuring violent heroism. And it's not just a film phenomenon. You see this in print, you go back to radio, you know, Crash Gordon or Flash Gordon, all the way back to epic poetry in the Odyssey and the Iliad. It's not that stories with nonviolent heroism don't exist, but they're much harder to find. And this is particularly interesting now, since at this point we have over a century of nonviolent campaigns that have been effective and have been able to grab people's imaginations that have historically happened. So why hasn't this crossed over into the world of narrative fiction? Why aren't we able to tell fictional stories that reflect this wider range of heroism that we see in the real world? Now you could explore this from the angle of critique. You could, you know, what does this say about our society? What does this say about the profit motive of the studio system? Um, what does this say about the commitments of individual writers? But I think that misses an equally important issue, which is a question of poetics, i.e. a theory of writing rather than a theory of reading. And I think one of the things is, is that writers simply don't know how to craft these kind of stories. We have plenty of tropes and plenty of models and plenty of story structures for violent heroism, but not so much for nonviolent heroism. And in this case, I'm focusing specifically on stories where questions of violence are relevant. Um, I'm not including like romantic comedies where it's not even part of the plot. But I have, I think, one place we can look at to at least start finding some of the the models, tropes, building blocks that can be appropriated for telling nonviolent stories. And perhaps seemingly paradoxically, that is a genre of crime fiction, a subgenre of crime fiction called the confidence tale. And I'm using this term loosely to cover related genres as well, such as the caper story, the heist film, and what these all have in common, and you have, I've taken from tvtropes.com, a brief description of the caper and the con. And although it's not an academic source, it's well worth reading what they have to say about both of these. Um, but for now, I'll say that what they have in common is that the, the criminals, whether they're con men or thieves, they come up with a scheme, a plan that they put into action. And you're watching it to figure out do they pull it off? So in this case, it's really in many ways an inverse cousin of the detective story. In the detective story, you're trying to figure out how something that was already done was done. In the confidence tale, you're trying to figure out will they pull it off and how. And this genre has, at least as a self-conscious genre, has its roots in 19th century writers like Louisa May Alcott, Edgar Allan Poe, Herman Melville. Um, and Poe, as I suspect some of you know, is also considered the father of the detective story. Um, and so it makes sense that he would have been writing both types of stories in this time. And then moving into the latter part of the 20th century into the 21st century, you have um, it showing up on film and television. 
uh, the Paul Newman, Robert Redford film, The Sting, was one of the most popular movies of 1973. And it's a classic confidence tale. Um, the Ocean's Eleven franchise. And yes, I know this was a remake of a Rat Pack film, but it was the George Clooney version that really got popular. Maybe the, the best known heist film. And then you have a TV show like Leverage where you have basically an A-team of con men, you know, using their, their skills for the forces of good to carry out scams that help people, help underdogs who have been oppressed by more powerful people. So the, now, so you have some interesting structural elements here that I think can be appropriated and used for nonviolent tales. But I should also note that this wouldn't even be the first time we've seen stories with an internal structure that really echoes the confidence tale in other genres. Um, you have the biblical book of Esther. If you look at it through this lens, its internal structure looks very much like the internal structure of a confidence tale, but it would never have been considered that, that the genre didn't exist in its time. It was considered a sage tale, like the ones you find in the book of Daniel. Or the, or P.G. Wodehouse's um, Jeeves and Wooster tales about, um, you know, a adultish aristocrat who's always getting himself in trouble and his highly intelligent valet who has to get him out of these situations always involves putting, attempting a scheme, seeing whether it works out. You know, often Bernie will attempt a scheme, it will go wrong, and then Jeeves working behind the scenes will come up with his own plan to get his boss out of trouble. And I would say you would probably consider these comedy of manners, but again, you have an internal structure that's similar to the confidence tale, which I think um, shows evidence that this structure can be transferred to other genres. All right, so what are the elements of a confidence tale that I think are useful for exploring nonviolent heroism? And for reasons of time, this is gonna be fairly bare bones, but I'll get the main ideas out there. The areas I'm looking at are underdogs face off against a powerful figure or force, the protagonists map out a scheme, you have a section of the story that focuses on prep work, i.e. recruitment, you know, setting things up, scouting the mark and the location. Um, in both the prep work and the showdown section, you have complications, reversals, betrayals, and you have at the end the big play or the showdown where the, the plan is finally put into action. Let's go through these one by one. And can I make, there we go. I had the, the window of everyone's faces cutting off part of my screen. Hopefully that wasn't showing up on your screens as well. Um, so underdogs face off against a powerful figure or force. And this sort of evolved in the confidence tale genre as the way of dealing with a particular problem, which is that a grifter, a swindler who makes their living by scamming other people can easily seem unsympathetic. It's more of an anti-hero than a hero character. But if your protagonist is unsympathetic, that may be a problem for holding an audience. So the solution that it's sort of moved toward is just making the antagonist even worse. So for example, in The Sting, um, the antagonist is a powerful crime boss. So you find yourself rooting for these scam artists to, to, to pull off their scheme against him. And that works really well for nonviolent heroes because whereas the underdog dynamic is something that evolved to solve a problem in the confidence tale genre, it's really um, inherent and natural for stories with nonviolent campaigns. Uh, think of Gandhi versus the British Raj, 
the civil rights movement versus Jim Crow. It's a, it's a natural dynamic. And because for its own reasons, the confidence tale has moved in this direction, that resonance is already there. It's not a link that has to be made. All right, so the next part is the protagonists map out a scheme. And so you have questions like, who is the marker target and why? What is the end game? What is the basic plan? What are the main steps? How are things supposed to go? And so you need some version of this introduced fairly early on. So the audience knows what they're following along, but you can fill in the details as you go. And I just wanna briefly talk about how this maps onto a nonviolent campaign. Um, again, let's go back to the movie Selma. Who is the marker target? Well, there's a couple different ways you could answer that. You could answer it as it's the segregationists and they're being uh, you know, enticed into showing their true colors, or it could be the persuadable members of the American public. And if we go with the latter, I would say that Lyndon Johnson in that movie sort of serves as the avatar for that figure. Um, convincing Lyndon Johnson that the Voting Rights Act needs to happen now rather than later is a stand-in for convincing the American public of that. So the end game, the passage of the Voting Rights Act, the basic plan to have this march to Selma to draw attention to the issues and so on. So you can sort of see so the, how the same questions, the same structure for a con or a heist can be applied to a nonviolent campaign. And it can have a similar narrative structure. Um, another thing worth noting is that ever since David Maurer's The Big Con, The Story of the Confidence Man came out in the 40s, it's sort of been, and this is a nonfiction work that he wrote after interviewing a bunch of con men. It's been a Bible for people writing confidence tale type stories for screenwriters, et cetera. And in a similar way, books like George Lakey's How We Win, A, God to, a Guide to Nonviolent Direct Action Campaigning, or Michael Nagler's The Nonviolence Handbook, A Gu Guide for Practical Action, could have a similar role for writers wanting to put a nonviol nonviolent campaign into a story. So then you have the prep work section where you're in recruiting and introducing the team, scouting the mark and the location, putting the pieces into place. And this can also apply to nonviolent campaigns. And I'm gonna keep moving here, but let's take this excerpt from um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail. And I'm just going to read the middle part of it here so that it doesn't run too long. Mindful of the difficulties involved, we decided to undertake a process of self-purification. We began a series of workshops on nonviolence and we repeatedly asked ourselves, are you able to accept blows without retaliating? Are you able to endure the ordeal of jail? And I apologize if the lawnmower next door is bothering you. We decided to schedule our direct action program for the Easter season realizing that except for Christmas, this was the main shopping period of the year. So basically you can see that for these nonviolent campaigns, there is this prep work, this set, set up section that goes on. And the question is, how do you write that in such a way that becomes compelling, gripping, that it builds tension for an audience? And where do you find models of that? And because confidence tales also tend to have this setup and prep work section, we now have a place we can look to find models of how to write that type of setup in an engaging way. Um, complications, reversals, betrayals. So in a confidence tale, you often have issues with untrustworthy team members, conflicting loyalties and priorities. Uh, for example, in the in Ocean's Eleven, the, um, the owner of the casinos that they're planning to rob is dating Danny Ocean's ex-wife. 
and his team members get mad at him when they find this out because they they think that his judgment may be compromised, that he may be doing this for the wrong reasons. Um, you may have people who know too much. You may have prior adversaries who pop up and interfere with the current scheme or campaign. Um, and again, these complications can happen in the setup section, in the showdown section. In fact, they probably should happen in both because you know, it raises the stakes. It makes the story more interesting. This is something that is true across fiction. But again, looking at how confidence tales integrate these can give some ideas for how to integrate them into stories with nonviolent campaigns. And then finally, the big play or showdown. And so if you think of Ocean's Eleven, you have a significant portion of the movie is when they finally put the plan into action and they're carrying out the casino robbery itself. Um, you have surprises and complications pop up during this. Um, so in a story emphasizing nonviolent heroism, it would make sense to have a significant portion being when the campaign actually plays out. Uh, this fills a similar role to say the, the big fight scene at the end of many action movies that can run a chunk of the runtime. Um, the, the image I have here is from Kenneth Graham's The Reluctant Dragon in which uh, St. George shows up to save a village from a dragon only to discover that uh, the villagers have been uh, telling tales about the dragon, so to speak, and the dragon is actually a pacifist. But to satisfy social expectations, they eventually agree to stage a fight um, in which the dragon pretends to lose, and then St. George gives him a stern talking to and reforms him. And this satisfies the, the bloodlust of the villagers. So anyway, so that, that was the, that was the, the showdown or the big play in that story. And one other thing that often pops up in these confidence tales, sometimes linked, sometimes not, is the appearance of defeat and or secret parts of the plan being revealed. Um, for example, in The Sting, in another movie, Confidence, which though having its own story is, in terms of its plot, is pretty closely modeled after The Sting. You have the you know, main hero uh, seeming appearing to get shot and killed at the end, only to have it revealed that that was part of the scam as well, so that his enemies would think he was dead and wouldn't know that he was still around to come after. In Ocean's Eleven, you have the, the bomb squad, which comes in after supposedly a bomb destroys all the money, is actually Danny Ocean's team, and that's how they actually they get the money out of the casino. So you have this revelation of you know a last card being played. And this is something that is initially held back from the audience, so they get a last surprise at the end. And it would be interesting to see how this could be worked into um, tales fe featuring, you know, nonviolent heroism and nonviolent campaigns. And worth remembering that, um, just like uh, violence in fiction is stylized and not entirely realistic to the real world, there's no reason that when it's given a, a narrative massage, if you will, that nonviolence wouldn't take on a similar stylized nature. Um, it's not supposed to be exactly the same. It gives the idea. All right, so those were the, the main things. Underdogs face off against a powerful figure or force. Protagonists map out a scheme. Um, you have the prep work section. You have complications, reversals, and betrayals. 
any big play <coughs> or showdown. And I think the way these are handled in the way these are handled in Confidence Tales is potentially a really good model for how tales featuring nonviolent campaigns could be structured. Um, a couple more examples. Uh, the movie Lago, the Hollywood musical Lage Raho Munabai, in which an Indian gangster was very popular when it came out back in, I believe, 2005. Uh, an Indian gangster starts having basically being tutored in nonviolence by Gandhi's ghost. And I think this movie worked so well because the main character is exactly the sort of figure you would expect to see in the middle of a confidence tale. So it's a natural match. Or going even further back, you can go all the way back to ancient Greece and Aristophanes, Lysistrata, which is another um, story that I believe has an internal structure very similar to the internal structure of a confidence tale and is another example of how historically non stories with nonviolent heroism have made things work with this form. It's just there wasn't any theory of how that worked, so it wasn't replicable. And to keep us on time, I think I will just stop there. And let's see if I can figure out how to come up, come up. Oh, that's what I need to push. There we go. Okay. I'm not sharing my screen anymore. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, and now, last but certainly not least, John, you're on. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, so this is Storytelling for Social Change at Cincinnati's Harriet Beecher Stowe House. Um, first, a, a little bit about the house, I guess. I, I was going to show you a picture of it, but I realized that wouldn't make a lot of sense because it doesn't look like that anymore. Just a couple of weeks ago, the Ohio History Connection started restoration work on the front of the house and uh, they've torn off the porch that was there in an effort to replicate, uh, to take the house back to what it looked like in the 1830s and 40s when the Beecher family lived there. So um, we don't have that project completed yet. So I think showing you anything uh, in between would just look like a, a project in process. Um, so the house itself then in Cincinnati, not very far from Xavier where I taught for many years, uh, the house is owned by the Ohio History Connection. And I think that the term connection there tells you something about what the Ohio History Group is trying to do. Up until several years ago, they were known as the Ohio Historical Society, uh, but they changed their name in an attempt to try to connect past and present and to make the sense of history that they try to deal with more vital, more alive to, uh, to their audiences. Uh, uh, I'm a member of the Friends of the Harriet Beecher Stowe House. The Friends operate the house on behalf of the Ohio History Connection. So that's the present state of the house. What, uh, what isn't it historically? Well, it's not the birthplace of Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uh, neither is it where she grew up. She was actually 21 when she moved to Walnut Hills where the house is. Uh, and the house was built for her father, uh, Lyman Beecher, the famous preacher of the time to lure him to Cincinnati to uh, become president of Lane Theological Seminary there. Uh, he never owned the house, but he did live there for 19 years and uh, uh, while he was president of the seminary and then moved back east. Uh, so the house takes Harriet's name because uh, it's the only thing left of a neighborhood that was once very flourishing in Walnut Hills back in the 1830s and 40s. Elizabeth Blackwell, the first uh, woman physician in the US, her family lived there uh, and a number of others clustered around Lane Theological Seminary, which was the uh, a new seminary in the 18, early 1830s designed to create Protestant uh, Presbyterian ministers for the wilds of Indiana, Illinois, and Ohio. Uh, 
which at that time were seeing a great influx of population from immigrants, particularly Germans and Irish, who tended to be either Catholic or uh, not churched at all, or Lutherans. Uh, and from the Presbyterian perspective, these were people who needed to be converted. So uh, the Presbyterians thought they needed ministers for that part of the country. Um, so that's what the house is historically, its relation to Harriet is that she did live there off and on during her 18 years in Cincinnati, but it was never, it was never for a long period, her primary residence, but it takes her name because she's a lot more famous than Lyman Beecher, her, her father. Uh, what the house isn't to us, despite it's bearing the name of Harriet Beecher Stowe, is a shrine to Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uh, the Ohio History Connection and the Friends of Harriet Beecher Stowe have a much more dynamic view of what we want the house to be than a kind of shrine to earlier authors. There's a book by Anne Trubeck called A Skeptic's Guide to Writers' Houses. Uh, in which she visits various writers' houses and makes fun of the people who would try to turn the house into a shrine. And uh, instead, uh, uh, what, well, what is it? What are we trying to do with it? Um, well, we want to tell a story, but we want to sustain, here's, here are the words of the, um, of, the, of the mission of the Friends of the Harriet Beecher Stowe House, to sustain the legacy of Harriet Beecher Stowe and the Beecher family home in Cincinnati by facilitating historical exploration, raising awareness and stirring passion for positive change, and finally supporting dialogue about social issues related to that legacy. So you can see that it's really an attempt to connect past and present and with a very, with a serious concern for positive change and uh, social issues of Harriet's day and the way that they're reflected in social issues of our own time. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the goal. And uh, even though Harriet is the most, arguably the most important American storyteller of the 19th century, um, we don't want to make her story a sort of uh, static thing, but rather critique it, analyze Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, from a literary perspective. And that's kind of where I came into the, uh, to the, to the setup of the house uh, and to uh, connect, connect the story with the present time and deal with social issues that are still very much with us. Uh, so the next part of my presentation concerns the stories we tell, the story or stories we tell at Harriet Beecher Stowe House. Uh, both on the house's website uh, and Facebook page and in person. And I'll stress those that you could actually access uh, in, uh, online. Why are the stories so important? Well, they're very important to this house because we don't have many artifacts in the house. When the Beecher family left, moved back east, they took their own belongings with them. So we only have a couple of things that really date to that period uh, that are actually authentic. We have Harriet or Lyman Beecher's desk and, uh, and another desk and a couple of artifacts from Lane Seminary. But uh, we don't have much from that period. So it's not an overstuffed 1830s and 40s house at this point. Uh, what, what we fill it with is our stories. And the story of Harriet is very relevant to peace studies, I think. Uh, Joan Hedrick, her biographer, said this, Harriet came to Cincinnati as a New Englander, a rather provincial 21-year-old New Englander. And she would have shared at that time her father's belief in colonization as the response to, uh, to dealing with slavery to the extent that she was really even involved with it. Um, so she came to Cincinnati a New Englander, but 18 years later when she left, she was an American. That's what Joan Hedrick said. And I think it's a great way to think about Harriet and to sum up the stories that we, uh, the story that we tell about her. Because Cincinnati really was her formative time as, a, as an author. Uh, she didn't write Uncle Tom's Cabin in Cincinnati, but she wrote it right after she left. Uh, and uh, 
She had the experiences over her 18 years in Cincinnati that transformed her. When she came to the city, she started meeting abolitionists. She met people who held, who enslaved other people. Uh, she knew the Rankin family, and some of you may know of the Rankin house, it's about 50 miles east of Cincinnati, and it was that house that's been well known nationally as a, a major stop on the Underground Railroad. The Rankins were Presbyterian, or uh, John Rankin was a Presbyterian minister, much like Lyman Beecher. The families knew each other. Um, there was a, a lot of exchange between them, and it is from the Rankins that Harriet Beecher still heard the story of a woman they called Eliza, who became the prototype for, or was the prototype for Eliza in Uncle Tom's cabin. Uh, so she actually, uh, across the river, uh, one summer witnessed an auction of enslaved people. So Harriet was seeing all sorts of things there. She actually had a woman working for her, a young African-American woman working for her, whom Harriet thought uh, and everybody else thought was free and legally she was, but her former uh, slaveholding uh, person came after her and uh, Harriet got her husband, Calvin, and her brother, Henry Ward Beecher, to uh, take him, uh, or take the, uh, the woman to uh, a stop in the Underground Railroad about 11 miles north of Walnut Hills, where the, where the family, uh, where Harriet was living at the time. She married uh, a teacher at the college, at Lane Seminary, and they lived in the neighborhood for those 18 years. So she would have been in and out of the house uh, many times. It's also, the house is also where she lived for a short time right after her marriage when her husband was in Europe buying books for the college. Uh, she lived there and that's where her first uh, two kids were born, a set of twins. Uh, she was also married nine months before that uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the parlor of Harriet Beecher Stowe House. So definitely connected to the house. Um, so those are her experiences. She also discovered herself as a writer during her 18 years in Cincinnati, as an imaginative writer uh, by her membership in the Semicolon Club, where she dared to uh, share the first story that she had written, the first creative efforts that she had written. And when she wrote uh, a sketch, she actually disguised it and pretended it was something she found, she came upon and uh, asked a friend to, uh, to read it. And only after it was read and received well did she acknowledge her, her, uh, right, uh, her ownership of that story. So really, her 18 years and the story we tell of those 18 years in Cincinnati are the story of the evolution of a conscience and the desire to act on what that conscience told her to do. And that's what prompted her to write Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, and she said this when she proposed Uncle Tom's Cabin to Gamaliel Bailey. Uh, an editor of the National Era. But I feel that now, you know, normally I wouldn't talk about this as a woman writer, she said. I wouldn't tackle this subject. But I feel now that the time has come when even a woman or a child who can speak a word for freedom and humanity is bound to speak. So, and in fact, the movie that I appear in the documentary, Becoming Harriet Beecher Stowe is very aptly titled because the Harriet Beecher Stowe that we know as an Uncle Tom's Cabin really was created here in Cincinnati. And she actually became Harriet Beecher Stowe rather than Harriet Beecher when she got married in Cincinnati as well in her early years in Cincinnati. Uh, in, the, in her late year in Cincinnati, 1849, the last year she spent uh, in, the, in Cincinnati, she, uh, uh, she uh, uh, lost her 18 month old child in the cholera epidemic. And that had an enormous impact also on Uncle Tom's cabin. If you've read the book, you know, the mother child bond is absolutely essential to that book. And the, the impact of uh, slavery on the mother child bond uh, is crucial in that book. So that's part of our story. That's the story of Harriet. The other part is the story of the house itself. Uh, built for Lyman Beecher, owned by Lane Seminary, occupied by the seminary, it's owned by the seminary itself for about a decade after Lyman left in the early 1850s. Uh, bought by a Monford family who maintained it many years and made many changes in the house. It eventually became a boarding house uh, and a tavern uh, 
which would eventually be listed in the Green Book that many of you know about uh, in the, the 19, at least in the 1940 edition of the Green Book, it's in there uh, as a safe place where African American travelers can stay uh, and can, uh, can visit the tavern. Uh, the story continues in the 1940s, later 40s, when it's built, bought by an interfaith and interracial group with the idea of turning it into an African-American cultural center, um, an amazing idea for the, uh, for the 1940s. So that's part of our story too. So story or stories, that's, that's what we tell. Now, how do we tell those stories? through our programming, in-person traveling exhibits recently on women's suffrage and on Isabel Beecher Hooker, Isabella Beecher Hooker, the uh, sister of uh, Harriet. Um, also visiting speakers, uh, including a former freedom writer who spoke um, and uh, a recent panel on the new uh, set of essays, Mockingbird Grows Up, rereading Harper Lee since Go Set a Watchman. Uh, uh, this was a 2020 collection of essays revisiting, uh, revisiting To Kill a Mockingbird. And we had some of the people who edited that anthology and contributed to it there. We also have two con continuing discussion series which have been forced onto Zoom uh, through, uh, because of the pandemic, uh, the Semicolon Club, which echoes the name of the, the club in Harriet's day. That's a nonfiction film and book club so you could access that on Zoom. Similarly, we've had a monthly literary discussion series that I've been involved with. Uh, one set was visiting Uncle Tom's cabin uh, that explored issues like Stowe's relationship with Frederick Douglass. Was Stowe an abolitionist or a colonizationist? Was Uncle Tom's cabin more uh, colonizationist or more abolitionist? Uh, Stowe and Civil Disobedience, and Paul Lawrence Dunbar's poem, We Wear the Mask, as a way of looking at uh, race relations in Stowe's day, Dunbar's day, and our own time. Um, and we also considered the issue of Stowe as partaking of the philosophy of romantic racialism, whereby uh, she believed that Black people were more imaginative and uh, more affectionate uh, than white people. Um, a benevolent, well-meaning, but ultimately benevolent and well-meaning, but ultimately uh, a form of racism that she imbibed also in Cincinnati because of the lectures of a guy named Alexander Kinmod who visited Cincinnati in the late 1830s. Uh, the lecture series then became the year of the woman the past year and we looked at Stowe's troubled relationship with Harriet Jacobs, uh, Charlotte, uh, the uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman was one of our uh, one of our sessions, uh, the author of the Yellow Wallpaper and Women in Economics. Uh, and this coming Wednesday night, we're going to talk about uh, the cult of domesticity as we see it in uh, uh, in uh, the works of Catherine Beecher and Her and Harriet and things they wrote together. Uh, it's called uh, Tips for Holiday Entertaining from. Uh, Catherine from the Martha Stewarts of the 19th century, Catherine Beecher and Harriet. And uh, we'll look at their, you know, the underlying uh, ethos of, uh, of, their, of their homemaking, uh, their domestic uh, advice books. And uh, we'll also look at an, art, an, an essay by Philip Deloria, uh, the Harvard Native American specialist on uh, the, on the first Thanksgiving and the way it's been transformed into myth. So you can, a little plug for that. You can visit if you, uh, if you sign up online, it's free. Uh, and here's what else you can access online uh, uh, regularly uh, on the website. Meet the Beecher family, highlighting their individual commitments to social justice. The Lane Seminary, including digitized essay, uh, letters about its beginnings. Uh, the History of the House, the Cincinnati Journal and Western Luminary. Uh, that's a newspaper collection of, from two years in the 1830s with many links to excerpts from, from the newspaper published in Cincinnati covering pro-slavery mob violence in the city and religious controversies involving Lyman Beecher. Uh, 
bibliography and links to other primary sources about the years Stowe was based in Cincinnati, including the formerly enslaved Lane student, James Bradley, uh, his biographical statement. There's a link to that. And he was, an, he was a Lane Seminary student whose testimony was crucial in turning the Lane debates from colonization into abolition. Uh, and they became very, they were very controversial. They were, it was really the first time nationally that colonization and abolition had collided in a debate. And it, it uh, was, was seriously watched by people across the country. And it, it also was part of what shaped Harriet's consciousness. There are also reading lists for social justice issues in the 19th century and today. And the House blog has brief essays on the 1793 Fugitive Slave Law, the Missouri Compromise, and this is interesting, the Cincinnati Anti-Slavery Sewing Circle, which from 1846 to 61 made clothes for freedom-seeking fugitives from slavery. And also the group's likely connection with Catherine Kitty Dorham, who fled slavery in Kentucky with 36 cents in Cincinnati, parlayed her sewing prowess into considerable wealth. Kitty Dorham also worked on the Underground Railroad and sewed clothes for freedom seekers. Finally, there's a short piece about Thomas Morris, a Jacksonian Democrat who reached the US Senate, but broke with Jackson and the party over abolition at the cost of their support. By 1844, he was running for vice president on the Liberty Party ticket with James Burney, who also had a history in Cincinnati. So in conclusion, let me cite the House's tagline, writing the next chapter together. The House aims to be a good citizen with Walnut Hills groups and has done some walking tours of Walnut Hills recently, connecting with, with the history of that neighborhood. Um, it serves school groups um, and certainly provides historical information, but really much more focused on discussions, involvement by docents on the website and the public and Zoom events and in-person combined uh, with and in-person events, which will be combined with Zoom once we're able to resume in-person events. Uh, the goal again is to connect past and present and to activate the people we're involved with, to think about things from the past and the way they're connected to the present, to think about what's going on in the present, try to encourage dialogue with, uh, with the present and involvement, people putting their social insights uh, into action. So that's our way to try to write them to help people, to all of us, write the next chapter together. And I think that's, that's where I close. It looks like uh, Michelle put the, the house uh, on there. If you, if you don't remember it, you can just Google uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe House Cincinnati and uh, all the information. That'll connect you to the website. And there's also a Facebook group. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and uh, you can email them. Uh, and my email is a very simple one. It's just gets at xavier.edu if you want to get in touch with me. So back to Michelle. Thank you, John. Um, a lovely and wide range of interesting um, talks about storytelling and social justice. We're a small group. So I'll just say, if you have a question on mute, Unmute yourself and ask your question. I have a question. Thank you so much for all the all three presentations. They were great. Um, good to see you, John. It's been a while. I think we met many years ago at some conference or another. <laughs> Probably PJSA. It's Susan Cushman. How are you? Uh, maybe Hi, maybe at Xavier. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, I just a question for you, and then I probably have questions for everybody, but um, can you tell me the name of that sewing organization again, the Sewing Circle? Yes, let me have to look in my notes here for it. Um, Cincinnati. I, I love that kind of subversive, subversive yeah, politics. Yeah. Cincinnati Anti-Slavery Sewing Circle. Okay, great. And you could you could also check out the figure Catherine Kitty Dorham D O R A M, who's the who, who probably worked with that circle. She wasn't formally part of it, but she was doing the same sort of thing. 
Gotcha. And then Lane Seminary, Lyman Beecher Seminary closed down because he was having um, abolitionist debates, anti-slavery debates. What, what was the story there again? That, that I just want to make sure I caught it. Well, the Sudi fathers were very upset about uh, these Lane debates uh, because they didn't want to upset the South. There was such a trade between Cincinnati and the South at that time along the Ohio River. Uh, and Cincinnati was also producing uh, not just pork products to sell to the South, but the wrought iron work that you see so much of if you visit New Orleans, a lot of that was forged in the mills in Cincinnati. So they put the, the kibosh on the, uh, 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 on the debates, told the students to shut up and also stop and interacting with, uh, with the black community in Cincinnati. Uh, and of course the students like good students today or at any moment said, no, we're not gonna do that. And in fact, a group of about 40 of them dropped out of Lane Seminary in protest rather than, rather than be quiet. And many of them went to Oberlin on the condition that Oberlin would admit James Bradley the uh, black seminarian from uh, from Lane. Uh, this did have an enormous impact on Lane. And just a couple of years later, Lane had a grand total of about five students, uh, a couple of whom were Lyman Beecher's kids. Uh, mm. So it, it did, the, the seminary never completely recovered from this, although it did limp along until the 1930s when it formally closed. And the buildings were still standing until the 1950s, where sadly they were all torn down and there's now a Cadillac dealership uh, with a historical marker on the site of what was Lane Seminary. Thank you. Another question. If not, I have a question for um, you, Gabriel. Um, as you were giving your talk, well, two things came to mind. One, you confirmed. I was thinking of Herman Melville's The Confidence Man um, as, as you were, as you were um, introducing your topic. But I was thinking about um, trickster stories and the ways in which tricksters kind of work with the paradigm from the crime, crime fiction and could be another interesting trope for um, uh, nonviolent heroism. And I wonder what you thought about that. Well, I would agree, and I've had similar thought. And it's interesting that sort of some of the um, scholarship on, you know, confidence tales will say that the sort of con man character is similar but different from the trickster character. Mm -hmm. um, but with that said, I, I, I do think that the trickster character, I think there is a certain, I mean this in a very positive sense, almost a certain tr trickster subversive element to nonviolence in general. Mm -hmm. And so I absolutely think that drawing from trickster tales is another place to draw from for ideas about, certainly about, you know, characterization and even potentially story arcs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more question. I, I would say uh, too, to Michelle, to your comment, the, the trickster narrative applies to some extent to the freedom narratives too. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, we already have that set of texts mm -hmm. that, use, uh, that use that. Uh, and in response to Gabriel's paper too, I was thinking, when, especially the early part of the paper, I was thinking of the tropes of uh, space opera in science fiction that Ursula Le Guin mm -hmm. consciously tried to write against in mm -hmm. The Left Hand of Darkness and The Dispossessed, uh, and that Nettie Okorafor today mm -hmm. is, is picking up on in, uh, in the spirit of Le Guin, I'm thinking of the Binti trilogy particularly mm -hmm. where these characters find themselves as ambassadors, kind of peacemakers mm -hmm. between cultures mm -hmm. uh, and trying to, uh, uh, trying to bring to peaceful resolutions what would be Star Wars mm -hmm. in, uh, uh, in more traditional science fiction. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, and we could almost maybe call those what diplomacy tales mm 
Yeah. And yeah. which I don't know that that's a that that's a, a defined genre either, but that's another space to look at for potentials for different ways of of telling stories and mm -hmm. making them gripping and compelling. You know, my, my thought, I sort of going for one entry point I see, which was mm -hmm. okay, what we can do with how we can use this structure from confidence tales to make it easier to tell tales featuring nonviolent campaigns. But I think that's really just scratching the surface and that if we can get ideas about ways to do these things out in and accessible to writing communities, then things will develop in directions we can't even imagine right now. But it's, we have to have to get it started. Yeah. Chris. Yeah, I was gonna ask Gabriel as, as well. Um, and it's interesting though, you pick this, as you say, as an entry point into you know, opportunities for this literature. I wondered if you'd be able to maybe just briefly, and the, I don't think you quite got to this, but if you contextualize for us how this would sit within current non-violent fiction, right? As a, I imagine perhaps as somewhat of a niche part of fiction, right? Um, would it fit well? I mean, what is there, what are the current trends in non-violent fiction? Well, what I would say, and I think, um, uh, John, I get the impression that you've done some work on literature and peace as well. Um, and I'm just thinking, I'm just, you know, looking, you know, globally, historically, mm. there are enough works out there that if you look broadly enough, you can sort of create for yourself a, a canon, if you will, of nonviolent literature. But um, there's not a, how can I put it, a conscious genre self-awareness, if that makes sense. There's not, um, if you think of genres, not just as forms, but also as sociocultural institutions, mm -hmm. that's missing. And I think one of the reasons why, you know, so, you know, why you'll have these works pop up, but it doesn't become something that becomes replicated, that evolves into a genre, that, you know, becomes recognized tropes that other writers then use, is that there's not a specific awareness of what makes it work as nonviolent fiction, as nonviolent heroism. So we'll look and say, okay, this is what happens in this story. But the question of what are the specific things that allow this story to have a nonviolent hero's arc that works? And what writing lessons can we learn from that? You know, that poetics question. I feel like that perhaps that hasn't been asked in that hasn't been deciphered, so to speak. And that's why these stories, that's why, you know, Lagerach Pomunabai can be this hit Bollywood musical that gets lots of attention in India and around the world when it comes out. But you don't necessarily see that formula being replicated hmm. because this you know, the, that sort of even that surface level analysis I did of, well, the reason this works is because it, you know, you take a confidence tale structure and that's a good match for a nonviolent campaign. And well, here you have a confidence tale hero learning about nonviolence. So of course it makes sense that this story would work. I don't think the writers or the directors, you know, the creators mm -hmm. were thinking about it in that way. Mm -hmm which means they weren't thinking of, they were thinking about it in a, how do we, how do we make this work as a successful Bollywood musical, not what have we learned from this about how to write nonviolent stories. And if you don't know why what you did works in that way, you won't be able to repeat it in that way. 
It's just a happy accident. <laughs> it's a happy accident. And so what I'm hoping is that by sort of looking at it in this way, we can move so that instead of it be, these being happy accidents, because that there are, I think, a lot of writers out there with commitments, you know, with mm -hmm. beliefs that would be very compatible for telling these sorts of stories. Why aren't they writing them? Mm. Because they don't know how to write them. And, you know, like I said, this is sort of a first step, but for me, it looked like this is a potentially useful entry point. Um, so we'll, we'll see, we'll see. That's sort of, you know, the, the project that I quit my job to, to work. <laughs> you know, hopefully. Well, yeah. Well, I, I was about to say, this is, this is your task to write the poetics of nonviolent heroism. And we'll be waiting with baby breaths to read that. So I am mindful of the time. Uh, I want to thank you all again, panelists and participants for an engaging and informative afternoon. Um, let me remind you that next month's session is on polarization. It begins with a discussion on Tuesday the 10th, polarization in, in a time of misinformation and political strife, water, climate, and energy change continuing with a keynote on Thursday the 12th, featuring David Ragland, The Truth-Telling Project, Truth-Telling in Time of Polarization. I hope to see some of you um, at some of those sessions. Thank you so much for coming this afternoon and contributing to a lively and informative discussion. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.